being recorded. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first and last word poetry series. And I'm very excited to see all of you tonight, such a nice crowd. And uh, I'm Gloria Mindock, one of the hosts tonight, and Harris Gardner is the other host. And he'll be introducing the readers tonight. And after the reading, there'll be a short Q&A. So I give you Harris. Thank you, Gloria, and welcome one and all. Um, it's great to see everybody here, a lot of friends and a lot of new friends and some family. Uh, our first uh, featured poet tonight is Kathleen Aguero. She has published six books of poetry, her, her most recent being a World uh, Happiness Index from uh, Tiger Bach Press. She has also co-edited three volumes of multicultural literature for the University of Georgia Press. She teaches in the Solstice Low Residency MFA program uh, and in Changing Lives Through Literature in an alternative uh, sentencing program and is a um, consulting poetry editor at Canyon Review. And I give you Kathleen Aguero. Thank you. Thank you, um, Harris and Gloria, for inviting me to be part of this reading. And I want to thank all of you who have come. I see so many friends and fellow poets. And I don't know, I, I miss being in person, but I think I might be intimidated reading in front of so many people if it were in person rather than on Zoom. Um, I also want to thank Steve Huff and Phil Memmer of Tiger Bark Press for publishing my book. And I have to hold it up despite, ignore the post-its, but I want to thank Glenn McClure who gave me this beautiful photograph for the cover. Um, he's a fabulous photographer, Glenn McClure, and you should check out his website. I like to start my readings with a poem by someone else, just so we can all hear, hear more poets. And this is um, a poem by Eileen Cleary from her book, 2 a.m. with Keats. It's a beautiful book, very lyrical, but also very mysterious in a good way. So this is Eileen Cleary's poem. Lucy asks about my childhood, per Lucy Brock Bordeaux. In me, she divines no climate. We each take this to mean sorrow, as Senglo and Mauve almost define the landscape on 1 16th. The elms eavesdrop by the window, store lit, I'm sorry, by the window, store legends in their veins. Lucy reaches back 40 years to cover my girl body with a quilt. Though that girl stays in her room, my mind rises, then ventures outside into fattening clouds, a park filled with woodlands, a lake at the foot of a tower where geese walk single file to soften the wind. I notice the wind, the brilliant grass, call a few blades by their given names. Um, broke my right wrist the other day on the ice. So I've been practicing trying to turn pages with my left hand because I'm a, a righty. So it, it might be a little awkward. I ask your patience. Um, this is the title poem from this book. And as many of you must know, each year there's some organization, I can't remember the name of it, that publishes a world happiness report. And they distribute a questionnaire and ask all the people, I don't know how they choose their subjects, but they ask questions and they rate the countries in, in terms of their happiness. And in 2019, um, the US was number 19. I don't know where we are this year, if we've gone up or down. The World Happiness Index, 2019. How happy I am to live in the 19th happiest country in the world. Tulips rose this month through the arsenic soil, and the air I breathe is dark with money. In country 19, we can say what we want. A professor in California is allowed to say we elected a racist president, and those who disagree can leave phone messages threatening his nine-year-old daughter because we live free or die. Our children leave their homes each morning happy, not knowing what adventures the day holds. Might they be shot on the sidewalk by an officer who mistakes their cell phone for a gun or by a stray bullet in the playground? 
Or will they get to the school where they can hide in the closet from an active shooter? If they arrive home safely, there's always tomorrow, and maybe tomorrow their teachers will have guns. They are happy to be living in this just happy enough country where no one dares get sick for fear of bankruptcy. If you try in happy country 19, you too can be as rich as the sea. And if not, there are lots of street corners to sleep on, to live on and happy things to swallow or snort. And the fetid air from the subway gate will keep you warm at night if you knock someone else off it playing king of the mountain. We have problems, of course, that we're trying to solve, but we're from the country of hard work and initiative, of take what you want and say it was yours all along. Numbers one, two, and three, with their orderly lives, their health care and housing and good schools for free, grow soft and mushy. Not us. We're the ice inside a snowball, the rubber hose that leaves no mark. We dance on the head of uncertainty, cruelty's pin. Each morning, our sun rises, red, white, and blue. Fear Street. I lived on Main Street in a quiet city whose citizens spoke kindly of those they didn't have to live with. But underneath every complacent surface is a set of fangs, sharp and growing sharper, hungry, irritable, insatiable. How suddenly it seemed to draw back its lips. I didn't see it coming. They said, that's because you didn't have to. It wasn't gnawing on you. How indignant I was on their behalf. How I loved my indignation. They rolled their eyes at my innocence, which was expensive and costing their lives. But I'd never hurt you, I said. We all live on Fear Street, they replied. But you couldn't read the sign. We're all being swallowed. Go ahead. If you don't believe me, walk into it small. And um, this is a poem by a note, another photograph by Glenn McClure, uh, a photograph of Crow Patrick, a mountain in Ireland. And I think the only other thing you need to know is that Reek Sunday is the last Sunday in July when people make a pilgrimage up that mountain. Crow Patrick, after a photograph by Glenn McClure. Fog slips down the holy mountain, a soft shawl halting just above tree line, where from the sky and open water, dark clouds like claws reach toward the quiet house, still pasture. The corrugated water of the bay, waves barely raising their knuckles, will soon swell to pummel the shore. On Reek Sunday, pilgrims climb Crowpatrick to honor the saint who fasted 40 days on its summit. Some trudge barefoot to atone for their sins. Cleansed but bloodied, they return, carried on pallets. No pilgrims this day, the gap in the clouds filling with storm about to break through the camera's frame. This poem, I want to read it because I think we have a lot of people from the Boston area here. It's about the Liberty Hotel in Boston, which used to be the old Charles Street Jail. And um, when it was the jail, it housed several well-known inmates, I think as a sort of holding cell because they later went to other penitentiaries. Liberty Hotel, Boston. We didn't want to lose our jailness, says Dylan, but we wanted to do it, that is, renovate the jail into a hotel in a way that didn't come across as dark. And that quote is from Lockdown Luxury and Coppola. And I should have said that this poem tra time travels a bit. Those of you who have been in Boston for a while will recognize Buzzy's roast beef and also know it's no longer there. Cell to cell in saffron robes, Buddhist Buddhist monks bless the Liberty Hotel. Their chants cover the echoes of inmates shouting at Frankie entering the room where he'll spend five weeks in solitary, naked in a six by eight cell, four walls slimy with mold. Frayed rope dangles from the ceiling of the luxury suite. Incense circles the guards. Look, 
Frankie, just finished his bid, passes the bellhops carrying bags, the concierge calling cabs. As he approaches the day officer's barred window, collects his clothes, his watch, then exits the prison doors. He blinks through the exhaust of the traffic circle at Buzzy's roast beef across the way and eyeing the keys, chats with a valet parking cars. Hang a solitary sign on the doorknob. Sleep safe beneath blankets that mimic the ones Nicolo Sacco clutched to his chin. Under the ocular window, relax on darkened catwalks, glamorous with love seats, tables for two. Nearby, Malcolm in his cell block studies W.E.B. Du Bois, The Souls of Black Folk. We'll eat dinner at the clink, where vestiges of original cells create cozy nooks, and Bartolomeo Vanzetti silently rehearsing his speech to the court, or does Philly Mignon for a waiter in a uniform stenciled with Malcolm's old number, 22843. But first, cocktails in the former drunk tank, renamed Alibi, which we now think we have. We too can experience jailness at the Liberty Hotel, though we wouldn't recognize any of them, not Sacco, Vanzetti, Malcolm X, not Frankie, biting into his first roast beef in years. Sorry, these poems are a little grim in the beginning. <laughs> Um, I gave one reading and somebody said, but you seem like such a nice person. I am a nice person, I think. The writer, the horse. Fear saddled me, trained me, stabled me, named me, braided my hair. Carrot and stick taught me to dance, taught me to rear, shod me and hobbled me, bred me and pastured me, cantered me, galloped me, spurred me and drove me out of the meadow into the thicket, out of the thicket into the woods. Fear held the bridle, tightened the bait. Fear was the, tightened the bit. Fear was the master, brutal and quick. But was I the horse? Was I the rider? Um, some of you may know over the years I've been writing um, these self-portrait poems. And so I'd like to read two of them. Um, Self-portrait as, as geranium. Self-portrait as geranium. Here's all I've got. One showy cluster of red blossoms, fancy hat on a scrawny neck, rising above bare stems and gently ruffled leaves with their dark inner border, peach fuzz, leggy, untrimmed. I'm Americana red in a green plastic pot, a scatter of brown blooms, just the soil beneath me. I know how I must look, straining toward the window, close enough to tap it, better yet, break through. Look at me, let me out, look at me, let me out, petals weighing nothing. Self-portrait as an angry dog. Steal the roast, shit on the carpet, roll in something dead, Lick my balls, mangy fur, scabby fleas, hot slobber, carrion breath, lips pulled back, yellow teeth, growl, snarl, foam, pull at the leash, break the chain, leap for the throat, all of it. Um, as a little child, I was always teased with this, this poem that's an epigraph, this yeah, a poem, that's an epigraph to this poem. I had no idea it was by um, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Better self, and this is the epigraph. There was a little girl who had a little curl right in the middle of her forehead. When she was good, she was very good indeed. But when she was bad, she was horrid. When I'm bored by some slow dinner story about to say, get to the point, my better self interrupts, please pass the peas, then tugs the choke collar. My better self makes excuses for me. I don't know what's got into her. She's not usually like this. Underneath it all, my better self wants to marry me, but she thinks I'm not worthy. She nicknames me Sweetie. I nickname her BS for better self. When I want to bite like a black fly, she's there first and blows kisses. 
Can't anyone see how awful she is? She says, you can come out now. Whoops, only joking. I snarl with a mouth full of maggots. She says, listen to me or you're on your own and everyone will know what you're really like. She says, don't talk back. Before we leave for the protest, my better self cuts her eyes at me. When you go to the rally chant, pump your sign if you must, but don't pick anyone's pocket. When she turns her back, I slip her wallet out of her bag. My better self insists we go to counseling. She wants to work things out. When the therapist asks, and how do you feel about that? I shrug while my better self sniffles and rubs her cheek. We're getting a divorce, I say, and I'm taking the car and leaving our issues unresolved because I don't want to prolong this any longer than yesterday, meaning I took the keys from the counter, the engine is running, have a nice life. Um. This is a poem for my father who passed away a few years ago. His answer. I lean forward, trying to keep up conversation as I watch my father make himself eat. At 96, he struggles to maintain his weight. 40 minutes for a tiny sandwich, a speck of salad, then cake, ice cream, whipped cream, chocolate sauce. I can't taste anything, he tells me, only desserts. The sweet taste buds are the last to go. He's still ship shape, my father, the marine engineer. Every morning he showers, shaves, dresses himself. I used to be handy, he says. I went around and fixed things for everyone. Now it takes two people to help me in and out of the car. <clears throat> I don't want to be bedridden. And what can I say? the mouthy child who started this by asking what he looks forward to each day. Nothing, he shrugs. I've outlived myself. <clears throat> and the last poem is called Night Sky. Our troubles show up like stars disturbing the blank night, petty compared to the moon, jewel in a black velvet case, but grouped in constellations, what satisfying tales. The big and little dippers quench our thirst to be tragic as Callisto turned by Juno to a bear. Likewise, we've been wronged by a jealous lover's fear or like Andromeda, ruined by a parent's pride, then rescued just in time, or so we like to say to make our lives exciting, at least significant as stars we map our passage by, a story we can squint at, something with a shape. Thank you very much. So anyway, uh, let's have another round of applause for Kathleen Aguero. So uh, our, next fe our next featured poet is going to be Michael and Sarah, who's pretty widely known, but I will give him his introduction anyway. Um, he spent many years as an activist and an organizer. He's a co-founder of Mass Poetry. He currently serves on the executive committee of the Redress Movement and the organizing team for Together We Elect. His first book of poems, what Remains will be published next summer by Calcite Press. Please welcome Michael and Sarah. Thank you, Harris, and thank you, Gloria. It, it is such a great honor to read alongside Kathy and Kathleen, who are such wonderful and accomplished poets. You know, I feel in many ways that I'm just getting started with that very first chapbook of poets, poems coming out this summer, the first book at 75. Um, I've been tweaking those, so I'm going to read a bunch of those with a couple of new ones. Um, I'll start with the very first three poems I ever had published. You know, all of us, I think, get attached to those very first ones, rejection after rejection after rejection. And then Mid-America Poetry Review rejected a poem but said, well, but if you change it to the third person, we might take it. It took me about two seconds to write them back and say, done. Now, I've reverted back to the original first person. In the Deep End. 
Anytime I could be a boy alone in a pool, I would play the same game, glide out to the deep end, stop, clap my arms in a snow angel sweep, send myself down, drop stone slow, touch bottom, crouch there, happy in that pressure, until I flexed my feet, bounced to rise, broke the surface, and breathed over and over, all day without commotion or haste, convinced that if I could stay down long enough, I would become enough, fish or otter or other, that I would never drown. This next poem is probably the only poem that I'm really associated with, um, but I'll share it again. The Contest. My son sprints all unpracticed nonchalance to match my stride at the lake's warmed edge. Silent against the coming of cooling dark, standing together as if to pray, we pee. Mine falls short, yellowed, diminishing with a rustling hiss, vanishing into the sponge, decay of bark, soft rust of pine. The last veins of bronze light outline the profound arc of sparkling piss as he starts to sway, widening as he swivels side to side with unrestrained, enduring force. Eyes delight, tossing his wolf-thick hair, his delicately boned chest bare to the low sun of summer's end. The third poem I got accepted was accepted in a strange place, the Journal of Medical Humanities. Uh, we poets are desperate for audiences wherever we can find them. It was written when I saw a photo of the sonogram of my first grandchild, Cyrus. It's hard to believe, but he's about to turn 15 and is approaching six foot three. So seeing that sonogram at 19 weeks. Each chinked link in the precise formed fishbone backbone, each particular within a swirled cosmos of black grain and flecked white, delineating a pear curve in a coned basket, a scrap of continuation, marker of the long march away from the dorsal, already prehensile hand, fingers that lightly flutter, larger than likely head, skull unfleshed as if to remind us of what remains in the end. Now the impossible beauty of possibility, taking shape faster than the future, the inevitable gates and alleys, foot flex, blood bloom, even grief. I've been working on two poems for a very long time and finally I think I've finished them. So I We'll share them tonight. First one is called Finding a Photograph of My Mother Modeling, Young and Naked. She stands as if striding into the center of the group of eager art students. Chiseled straight nose, silhouetted sculpted breasts, the black night of her hair pinned up to reveal the full sweep of her nude neck, one arm raised revealingly, the other trailing, her slender but full top fused to already thick Rodan thighs that had yet to open in delight, yet to push out her finest art. A determined artistry in her stance, as if to entice each brush to dance down the length of her body, lush and young. I was a baffled boy, impossible to connect this woman, proud, brazen of body with the tired, thick-waisted mother across the kitchen table, the thin skin of the blued half moons under her eyes pulsing to the rhythm of disappointment. What did I know? Nothing of the engine of desire, nothing yet of regret. Continuing a little parents and children, parent and child. It's true. I hated my father's reptilian toenails, thick, 
ridged, battered, as if remnants of an armor plating that had failed to protect him from the world. And below that barreled belly, those thin measled shins spotted with their mysterious purple bruises and his deep snoring as annoying as the buzzing of a large fly trapped in a tight room that was my childhood recurring nightmare. I still remember the day I looked down at him, seeing for the first time a small man. My mother dressed me every day in her diaphanous, silent disappointments. As a retriever knows without being told to chase the ball, I understood I was not to be like him. My own grown children have all recently left after a brief holiday visit. The house is again ordered silent. It is so trite, this longing to make everything right. Yellowstone in winter for my friend Kim Clare. The flies of Yellowstone in winter live unseasonably, hovering within inches of water. Heat breaks through, heat alive within the mineral speck, a life chain that climbs hot and frothy up finally to flies, persistent, precarious. An unexpected gust can send any one soaring toward the sun too high. I was in the white cold of Yellowstone watching flies when you slung that rough rope over the rafter in a bare Montana cabin when you chose to tilt that chair. I was interested that Kathy shared a poem about Lucy Brock Boyd. I was very lucky to study briefly with uh, Lucy, who was a great, great poet and also a generous and, and wonderful teacher who tried very hard to smack sentimentality out of my poetry. I don't know that she succeeded, but when she died, I wrote this poem. Too soon, always too soon for LBB. When this long winter ends as winter will, and spring arrives as spring must, lilacs and hyacinths scenting the warming air, you will not be there. When days get long, nights summer hot, cats yowl and cats prowl, I will look for velvet and lace and lace up boots and not hear that singular voice, contralto of the night, alchemist able to write life's lead into laced, gold gorgeous lines, substance from smoke-filled air. I will look, but you will not be there. Your large heart, your art, lush voice of vireo and thrush, silent now, too soon, too soon. It's always too soon. At least for one instant, the stars should wobble, air tremble, earth spin, stop. Race is just a story. In the alley or lewd casino, every game its dealer, every story its teller, in caves, in cotton fields, on playing fields, while plowing fields, in ice storms, dust storms, monsoons, typhoons, fictions. The shape of your head, the meaning of your lips, the curl, the color, the kink, the length, the sun, the cold, the light, the dark. Race is just a story, but because of it, the shackle, the whip, the brand, the noose, the bullet, endless songs of morning rising like soft smoke in the evening sky. Race is just a story, every story its teller, every salt tear tastes the same. On the death in Alaska of Marie Smith Jones, the last speaker of EAC. Water is never lost. It falls, flows, blows, miss, again to fall, now is rain, now is snow. The liquid of language can come to nothing. Words, sound, songs strung along the taut tendon of 10,000 years vanish as if wind blown over winter, flecks of ice running over the crusted roof of the Copper River. Speechless light lets go, 
gone the tongue, gone caribou beyond counting, ptarmigan and fox, white against the white, years of pestilence and pox, gone the feel of fat against the top of the tongue. True story, George Washington's teeth. A little different than most people have been told the story. George Washington's teeth, ivory pulled from the pink, unblemished, white from black, sold, bought, not stolen, nine teeth, 122 shillings. The familiar never smiling mouth, thin, grim, always aware of destiny, choosing not to be king, hiding a disconsolate mandible, desolate, reborn with the false, not wooden. All men are created equal. Some are forced to sell their teeth, see children on the block. This is the story of our birth. So much extracted, red clay turned over, black hands on the plow, nine teeth for a white mouth, 122 shillings, one third the golden rate. End of summer, 2017. In this summer and fall of our disquiet, the peach trees cracked under the burden of their bounty. The apple trees seemed blissful in their fruitfulness. Hummingbirds floated in the garden, their throat gorgeous, gorgeous, changing color in the summer light like the shimmer of oil thinning on water. Our grandchildren each seemed to grow another inch. Everywhere was a lush excess on the manure pile, volunteer pumpkins, dozens of giant orange orbs among green vines and two large leaves. The deer emerged at dawn, stepping out of their dense woods for a banquet, tough teeth chewing the plentiful seeds, firm flesh. And each morning we awoke among all of this and were dismayed. Last poem, even tied deep in the river of grass, an epitaph, and yet the ways we miss our lives are life, yet, yet, to have one life add up to yet. That's from Randall Gerald's A Girl in the Library. Eva tied deep in the river of grass, light spilling in from the edges of the world, gregarious congregations of roseate spoonbills, ajaya, ajaya, pink breast, pink throat, marble pale, pink rippling through white mirrored clouds. No imagining here, only wanting. Entire horizon filled with homecoming. Each bird flies to space as if it had an anointed place. Shrubs topped with the white spindrift snow of ibis, spotted with here and there and hinga, spread wing hung as if dying, wet wings drying. We name everything, squadron of pelicans, gulp of swallows, Siege of humpback blue herons, murmuration of starlings, dissimulation of birds, as if once absurd multitudes meant numbers without end. Wind, an eager brush of wing, murmurs to water. Birds splash into sunset, settle into clouds, reflection in a world without reflection. Everything going to water, going to ground, everywhere herons bob, everywhere egrets. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Let's have another round of applause from Michael and Sarah. Yeah, you go. Nailed it. Bravo. Bravo. Way to go, Michael. Okay. Well, <laughs> special effects there. <laughs> All right, so uh, our third featured uh, poet of the evening is definitely known to everybody here and well beyond. Um, Kathleen Spivak is the author of 12 books of poetry and prose from Doubleday, Grey Wolf, Knopf, and others. Among them are A History of Yearning with Robert Lowell in his circle, uh, Plath, 
Sexton, Bishop, Cunis, and others, and most recently a third novel, Unspeakable Things, published by Alfred uh, A. Knopf. Please give a nice warm welcome to Kathleen Spivak. Yay, Kathleen! Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My phone is cutting out, and it just did cut out. So um, if it does that, Harris, just let me back in, okay? No, that uh, um, Gloria will. Well, I sent you, anyway, I sent you or somebody, I just sent you an email saying, my phone got out, please let me in. Okay. Okay, so uh, first of all, thanks to Harris and Gloria, who worked tirelessly to um, keep us connected and to give us a community. Thank you. And they've both come out with new books and I am going to get both of them and recommend them. Now I'm going to just read, I'm going to read, um, oh, before I also want to mention that I have a new little chat book coming out with Finishing Line Press. It's called Homage. And I'm going to read a few poems from that. I'm going to read maybe four poems. I think that I think that will uh, fill my time. Anyway, the first one is called Book Rest. You just tell me if you get the sound because I had to use my, I'm using my phone. Are you okay, Harris? Okay. Already asleep, you turn your broad back away from me, resigned and heavy, as if walking somewhere else. Embodied, I enter the book and the bed, finger the sheets. What might they tell of our lives? Counterpoint, counterpain, all the hours, the loves, dreams, and what is still nameless, yes? The dark. But wait long enough, you will see it is not really serious yet. It is silvery darkness and shadowed. The serious weight of blankets and the lightness of a summer throw. It's carelessness. And now I slide in comfortably between. The lamplight makes its private glowing circle, cradles me the book of the bed, its white page half open, piled high with its books and histories. I read over and open just one. The letters rearrange into an ascribed meaning, or so we tell ourselves, turning a page. And no, I am not just ready to finish, folding the envelope of darkness settling into the hush of the tomb. I turn on my left side and lean the book against your back. You're used to this. Your even biscuit rising breath. Jasmine and honeysuckle rise from the night garden. Soft air flirts with the screened window. Oh, may this never end. Don't close the book. How does it end? The next one is called Monet's path, and it's from the history of yearning. You walk into the painting. You walk down the path through the bleached grass toward the village. The cicadas are singing, and you, you are going someplace ordinary. Perhaps it is to the post office. Perhaps it is just to get milk. 
the dry grasses are hardly stirring, and a museum guard is at standstill watching you. You walk next to the poplar trees. You walk through sun and shade. It is an ordinary errand, but the flowers shriek brighter than daytime and the weeds murmur, notice me, notice me. The painter is so much a part of this, the crickets hardly bother to silence themselves. Nothing stops singing. Grass celebrates its greenness and the moist ground underfoot springs back debonair as you part it with your eye. It is almost a feeling, this green dapple of light and shade, framed, dazzling, just as when you entered it. Um, I'm going to end with two more poems. I have to look at how am I doing for time. I'm okay, Harris, for time? Okay. Peace Pilgrim. This is a, a real person, by the way. Peace Pilgrim. She was 80 some years old when she finished walking across America. A little white haired old lady in pants and a navy blue sweatshirt. Her name written across the back, Peace Pilgrim. Her past, she had renounced it and all attachments to, focusing only on her naive message, peace. That simple word walked with her, peace. Inner, individual in families, community and world. A childlike faith. Were things so complicated then? Or was she crazy? An inspired bag lady with a cockeyed glint to her bright blue eyes? A glowing lunatic hobo for which America is famous? She walked away the latter half of her life, crossing and recrossing the country in a constant state of prayer. Her real name was unknown. She had changed it so long ago anyway. The details of her life, her family, she said, were unimportant, only what she was doing right now in this glistening moment. The scent of pine breathing up from the roadside, rain or scarves of wind against her face. Wait a minute, ah, hold on, okay. The scent of pine breathing up from the roadside. Rain or scarves of wind against her face. Thick clouds that changed about her, yet cradled her heart. A glowing ember around which the night sky swirled. She carried a blanket, water, and answered her mail. She slept, saying, body, lie down by the side of the road, in culverts, meadows, and on the floors of local jails. She ate only when offered food, which was surprisingly often, she said. Spent time with folks along the way, believed in something, something she called God, and didn't expect anything else. Surprised, life, life was a perpetual gift. Singular in happiness, she spent her life walking around peacefully, looking out at the world in delight, writing about it sometimes. A harmless little loony old lady, peace pilgrim. Um, Okay, I'm going to read, this is my last poem. And the title is, There is a word, or several, must be.
breathe these words in all languages before they're lost. Thank you and mean it. The things we take for granted and now have abandoned us or will. Water, air, rich earth beneath the rubble. Thank you for our daily breath. Give us this day. Exhale the little thank you words. They're quick. Slip out our pores. Clean hair, a shower, soap and aspirin. Thank you, whoever you might be. Appreciation, a survival skill we never get to hone enough. Thank you for life, for health, for the newborn baby and jump, whoops, I'm sorry, for the newborn baby slipping out between the hips, for wondrous eyes and little rosebud fists. Thank you, sweet pea. And jump ropes, patience, teachers of the world, and teach me self-control. Migration, vanishing the butterflies, the orange peach of the Oriole. Whatever bright-eyed bird you once saw flicker past and wondered, what was that? You were lucky to have it show itself. And you are lucky, perhaps, to be it. Plumage, proud breast and wings. Thank you for shelter, the blanket of morning, of this morning. When first frost found naked earth, or when you found that one shade tree in the desert of last summer. Sun like a knife blade, now the reluctant release of pain. Oh, those precious moments when it goes away. Do you still remember having such moments? There is a word or several must be in all the languages for saying thank you in this world of swirl. Thank you for not yet abandoning me, my body. Wait a bit. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. What a wonderful Let's night of poetry. Really wonderful. Let's, um, have another, let's have another round of applause for Kathleen. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> thank Sorry. You. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay. That's a gift. Um, so now we come to our short Q&A. Um, so if you have questions for any of the readers, um, I can't see all 60 of you. So um, I'll call on who I can see and maybe you could just, um, if I don't see you, just uh, speak up. Uh, so does anyone? Uh, go ahead, Brenda. I just want to say that was a wonderful evening. I mean, I missed last month and boy, you guys were all great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, Sarah? Kathleen, that was so moving. I, um, I'm so glad I could be here for this. I'm just wondering if we could have, a, or is that a last poem that you just read, is that available? Well, it will be. Um, it will be. I mean, um, what can I say? If it isn't, if it hasn't been published, I don't know, I don't keep track, but I hope it has been published somewhere locally. Um, but if not, it will be, and uh, I'll let Harris and Gloria know. Yeah, okay? Yeah. I have a friend who's dealing with the, the, who would really benefit from hearing that. Yeah. I wanna say thank you, Kathleen, too. <laughs> Kathleen and I have known each other for, well, I guess over 50 years. Wow. To really go back. And I can see, you know, I've seen so many iterations of her work. And this one, thank you, is just so deep. You know, I could just 
you know, I know some of your challenges and, you know, and, and the way you say thank you to life, you know, has always been an inspiration for me and you expressed it in the poem. So thank you, my dear friend. Oh, Dolores. <laughs> I owe you a phone call. We, we'll be talking soon. Yeah. Okay. And thank you. Thank I, you. You've been busy. I have been writing poems. I've just been waiting for yours. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, is there anyone else that um, has a question? Uh, yes. I, a comment from California. Uh, I feel all of you have brought us closer to being alive, not to, you know, much closer. I, I'm wondering in reading your poems, I'm asking everyone here, these are marvelous. If, how do I ask this? What your thought is about the listener? Because you are, you are ministering to us. You are helping us see the beauty of life, whether it's pain or not. You are helping us be more alive. Thank you. Lovely. Uh, Kara, I, I can't tell if you're doing something. If you were, uh, somebody else want to say something or respond to her, the readers? Well, I'll, I'll quickly respond. Um, I can't speak for the other poets who are so much more accomplished than me. I have to say that I don't actually think about uh, the listener or, or the reader when I'm doing the, the poem. Um, it, it really is the poem and trying to find it um, and trying to be surprised by it and um, not to be overly intentional. And so I, I try to lose myself in sound and rhythm and image. Uh, and, and must admit, just hope that when it goes out into the world, if it ever goes out into the world, that it has some uh, meaning for uh, other other folks. Thank you, Michael. Anyone else? Yeah, I think I was finally unmuted. I just wanted to thank you for the lovely comment to say that you felt the poets were ministering to you. Um, I am aware of the audience, although it's a little bit distant on Zoom, Zoom and I, I, I do feel a connection. I never think of myself as ministering, though, I, but I do think there's a sort of, hopefully, some kind of exchange of energy or spirit or something. I, I feel it when I listen to poetry, when I listen to the other poets tonight, I certainly felt um, grateful for their generosity in sharing their poems. Thank you, Kathleen. Anyone else? Uh, yes, Rina. Uh, you're muted. I just wanted to say that it's good to hear poetry that is uh, deliberately communicating. Very often the poetry that we hear today is, is a kind of self-communion. And, and it, it lacks the other half of the poem, which is the, the, the reader, the listener. I always feel that I don't think of a specific reader, but I know that <clears throat> something wants to listen. It's, it's in myself, it's, it's part of myself that I may be trying to talk into something or out of something, but there is a listener always. And it's good to know that poetry remains communication, which is how it started. Thank you, Rena. Someone else? Um, if I may just say from a wintry Maine that my heart is warmed by the poetry that I've heard tonight. And I wanted to especially thank Kathleen for her poem, thanking for what we have in this life. It was, the poem was as though she were singing from my heart. I, I don't know how else to say it. Oh, thank That's you. A beautiful thank way you. to say it. <laughs> a beautiful way, thank you. You're welcome. 
and thank you. It was, it was a true gift. Now I have to see who, I have to, now who was the speaker? Was this Sarah Nelson? No, this is Veronica Kate Frank. Oh, Veronica, Veronica, sorry. Yes. I mean, well, I'm looking at. I, I was the one who said it was incredible. That's so many um, people I know. Thank you, Veronica. I think of you a lot and you encourage me a lot and you don't know this, but I'm telling you now. <laughs> Thank you. It's all due to our mutual friend, Kate, who's here tonight. It's a yes. real gem, right? Incredibly precious. Yes. I'll just add to your discussion that miraculous as Zoom is, that it can bring people from very distant places into the same reading. Something is missing when you're not in the same room together. It was an absolutely beautiful reading, but you don't get to hear back very much from us as we experience it. And I'm grateful that you would deliver this quality of evening, even with a relatively silent audience. Anyway. I'm sorry. Special but, poems from each of the readers. You know, we feel you. We feel you. I mean, there isn't an either or because Zoom is the best we have. And agreed. And we feel you. We feel the silences. We feel the receptivity. You know, we're not saying, oh, this isn't as good as being in the same room. It's different, but it's all we have. And I'm really grateful for it. Agreed. Arena, you wanted to say something else? Go ahead. Um, unmute yourself, please. I wanted to say that I'm grateful for Zoom, <clears throat> which I did not expect to like at all because I like people in front of me that I can touch and, and really speak to face to face. But we have a, we have a, a, a Latin American group <clears throat> that used to be very local. And now we have people <clears throat> who join us from Argentina, Colombia, Mexico, all over the Spanish speaking world and in the United States too. And it's just amazing how much you can connect to people like that to people from such a distance. It's as if the poetry itself created a, a space, created a, a road. Yes, yeah, so true. And um, Mary, you wanted to make a comment? I do. I want to repeat what the last person just said is, uh, yes, there's something about being in a room with people, for instance, Watching movies is never the same at home as it is in a movie theater. But on the other hand, this is actually the first time I've ever heard my brother read his poems. And they were very meaningful to me. And they're also, it's also the first time I've heard the other readers. And I'm very, very, very far away and it wouldn't have happened without Zoom. So I think that much as these last few years have cost us, they've also given us quite a bit that we should be quite grateful for. I certainly am. And I'm grateful for this reading tonight. I truly am. Thank you, Mary. Kathleen, Kathleen you, you know that I know your poem so well. There is a word. Now, who is the speaker? Sorry, I'm on my phone. So could you just give me it's your Maria. name? Oh, Maria. <laughs> I love that poem. Thank you. And Brenda, you wanted you had your hand up? I wanted to add something um, because it, I, I'm an actress and um, I'm a stage actress. I love live, so I hear you. And um, that's my first love is being a stage actress. But I have been involved with so many meetings and readings and um this is a new media this is new media and we are a part of it and um reaching out to each other and knowing each other through it um it, i find it kind of exciting 
I don't find it robotic. I did it first saying, oh, we're all going like robots into new media. No, it's really a way to still reach each other. I think that's so important. And I, again, thank the readers tonight because, wow, you were great. I want to add one more thing because um, I was trained in readers theater, which is the performance of written work. And um, Zoom, it's a learning curve, really, how you work with it. But when you think of poetry, poetry is all about silence. Um, it, you're, you're sort of counterpointing your words against the stanza breaks, the line breaks. It's all about silence. And it's very difficult when people start with Zoom uh, because, and some of my friends have heard me say that, because um, we tended to equate, you know, to, to equate it with radio and with that horrible, God forbid term, dead air. And uh, I want to say that when you, when you read your poems, you want to get across how you constructed them. And um, Zoom actually lends itself to working with silence. It's true. I don't know what the other readers think, but it's true. Okay, we have time for one more question. If anyone has one, um, I can't see. I think it's Miriam. You have your hand up. Go ahead and unmute yourself. No, that's left over. Sorry, I already spoke. Thanks. Oh. Okay. No, um, that's me. That well, is. Me. Oh, Miriam Greenspan. Go yes, ahead. thank you. I, I just wanted to thank thank you all, Kathy, my good friend, and such a wonderful poet. So good to hear you, Kathleen. You may or may not remember me, but you helped I me remember you. start as what a poet. I, yeah, I really appreciate I hearing your your words tonight, um, and Michael. Um, I'm surprised to hear this is your first work. It, it, it was wonderful. So thank you all. That's really all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. And can we have another round of applause for the readers and the audience? <laughs> you guys are great. And I would like to turn it over now to Harris just to close us out. And, and again, thank you. And Michael, I'm excited about your first chat book. I can't wait to get it. So congratulations. That's really wonderful. Um, so um, Harris, take it away. So anyway, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, you're a great audience. The readers were fantastic. It was just a wonderful, remarkable, um, uh, uh, evening, of, uh, uh, evening of poetry and camaraderie. I was trying to remember my favorite word, camaraderie, and uh, it was truly a, a remarkable evening. And I'm glad so many people were here to hear these three wonderful featured poets. And I'd like to give a shout out to so many people that I know who came here tonight but I don't know if Gloria would give me any time for that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you, you know who you are, but I'll say a quick hello to Tim Suamon and Pui, who I haven't seen for ages, but we'll be in touch, and Dave Miller and so many other people here tonight. I, I don't want you to feel that I'm not mentioning you. It, it's just, it's such a wonderful, great gathering of, of poets and poet lovers. And uh, I was so happy to see everybody here tonight. And I hope you join us again the uh, third Tuesday in March. So uh, thank you. And thank you, Gloria. Gloria, you're always fantastic, both hosting and with the technology and also co-hosting when, when we have somebody else behind the scenes. So thank you. And, and um, Oh, about some applause for Harris and Gloria. Yeah, yay, yay, yay. <laughs> right. That's one way to cut off my wordiness. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, thank everybody. You. Good night, everybody. Bye. Thanks.